Hello everyone. This is the story about what if what if Naruto becomes the Pokemon master. Before we start the video, please hit the subscribe button and like the video as well. I have created playlist of every what if, make sure to check them as well. So, without any further ado, let's start. Bravo. Bravo. Bravo Naruto Namikaze. Bravo. Spoke a man as he applauded the feat that of the son of Minato Namikaze just accomplished. Naruto and Cynthia's match just ended. However, as soon as the Sinnoh champion returned her strongest Pokemon to its Poke Ball, Naruto doing the same with his Alakazam to give it some well-deserved rest, this random person had started commending Naruto for his win. The crowd that had gathered to witness the fight cleared away to give this person some room. Said person, who was clad in a black robe, which hid his actual appearance, made his way to the front of the crowd as he stood inches away from the blonde duo. He discarded his black robe a second later, letting the others know exactly who he was. There with his red afro and an excited look on his face was none other than Flint of Sinoa's Elite Four. Flint, what are you doing here? I thought that you had things to do in Sunnyshore City. Asked a moderately curious Cynthia while raising an eyebrow. Yes I did, but I managed to get all that stuff over with last evening. So I was able to head over her by today. Answered Flint, sating Cynthia's inquiring mind. It was a good thing for Flint that he had a flying type Pokemon at hand with him whenever he was traveling. The aforementioned flying Pokemon was a not a battler of Flint's, just a Pokemon that assisted its master in getting from place to place much faster. It was a lot more convenient too. That is not why I am here though. Flint paused for a moment as he looked at the man who had just beaten the woman who was hailed as the strongest in all of Sinnoh. Naruto Namikaze, I challenge you to a battle. A few people in the crowd behind Flint let out gasps of shock before they broke out into hushed mummers. Who is this Naruto Namikaze? First Cynthia wanted to challenge him and Flint is going to do the same thing too. Naruto must be some kind of big shot. Whoever Naruto is, he is my new best friend. Back with the man who was now the center of attention, again, Naruto did not know how to feel right now. Flint's sudden appearance and challenge had been so abrupt and out of the blue that Naruto did not even know how to properly react to it. I am not so sure about this. Said an undecided Naruto. He did not want to downright say no to Flint. That might come off as him being rude. Naruto was thinking of a way of declining the offer in a more polite manner. It never hurt to a little courteous every now and then. I think it is a great idea. Chirped a now happy Cynthia. Her mood had lifted a bit at the prospect of seeing one of her colleagues go up against the man that had bested her twice in a row now. She wanted to see how Flint would fare against someone of Naruto's caliber. Naruto was about to kindly reject the offer to lock horns with Flint when his, Naruto's, blue eyes met Cynthia's grey ones. Cynthia had pushed the long hair that was covering her right eye away and was now giving Naruto the best puppy dog look she could muster. Flint smirked at the sight of what Cynthia was doing. He stored this away as potential teasing material for the future. Oh crap. Not this again. Must resist, must resist. Shit. I am failing, I'm failing. Thought Naruto as he felt his resolve weakening for the second time that day. Naruto was contemplating if Cynthia had a pair of Sharingan. She seemed to be able to get things to go her way just by looking at him. Nah, Naruto dismissed that ludicrous thought almost immediately. Cynthia was too sweet and beautiful to be a stuck-up Uchiha. Damn. Fine I accept your challenge. But it will only be a one-on-one -on -one battle you hear me. Said Naruto a little begrudgingly. Naruto could already see his doom in his Cynthia's eyes. He knew that he couldn't give in to everything she wanted all the time. Thus, Naruto made a promise to himself to come out with a solution to this problem at the earliest possible. He did not know what had gotten into him. He must having have been a sucker for drop-dead stunning-looking women. Naruto wasn't even supposed to be here right now. He would have left Heart Home City already if Cynthia had not talked him into a battle with herself and now another one with Flint. Oh well there went his plans for the day. Such was life. You could make plans but you could never truly decide what happened until the time to carry out those plans came. Darn it Jiraiya-sensei, why didn't I listen to you when you told me about the dangers of women? Naruto cursed the toad Sanin in his mind, not realizing that he had called the man Jiraiya-sensei for once instead of pervy sage. 
In the afterlife, Jiraiya had a mysterious feeling that something awesome just happened. About 10 minutes later, Naruto and Flint were at another battleground, seeing as the last one that Naruto and Cynthia used was nearly demolished after their battle. This battlefield was slightly different from the last one. It was surrounded by eight or nine trees giving it a look that was somewhat similar to that of a forest terrain. Cynthia, Roland and the other members of the crowd also tagged along with the two. There was no way in the seven seas that they were going to miss a showdown like this. Brock was acting as the makeshift referee like he did for Naruto and Cynthia's match. There was also a camera crew over here this time around. At first Naruto was not sold on the idea of battling Flint in the media's presence. Though a few moments later a light bulb appeared on top of Naruto's head as an idea for his next prank hit him. So, Naruto let the members of the paparazzi stay. Flint had chosen his Infernape, his starter Pokemon, showing just how serious he was about this battle. Infernape was a bipedal, primate-like Pokemon that was primarily reddish-brown with sections of white fur on its chest, head and lower legs. Several gold markings adorned its body, swirled, circular ones on its knees and shoulders, flame-shaped ones on the back of its hands and a stripe around its back that formed two swirls on its chest. On top of its head was a large flame, which was never extinguished. Infernape had an orange, rounded muzzle, long, round ears with blue insides and a red ridge over its eyes. The eyes themselves were blue with yellow scara. There were five blue digits on both its feet and hands, and it had a long tail. When Flint saw what Naruto let out in return, he fell backwards. It was a Piku. Piku was a small, ground-willing rodent Pokemon with pale yellow fur. Its ear tips, collar and tail were black and angular. Piku had pink cheek pouches and a tiny nose, which looked like a dot, with Faulkner. Faulkner was sipping a cup of mocha as he and his friend the proprietor watched the battle between Flint and Naruto that was about to start any moment now. Flint had rung the proprietor telling him exactly which channel his battle with Naruto was going to be aired on. This was why Flint had hired the camera crew in the first place, so Faulkner could see this battle up live, even if he wasn't in Hart Home City. Flint had requested the proprietor to make Faulkner watch the match, saying that there was a very high chance that by watching it the leader of the Sunnyshore City Gym would become rejuvenated to battle again. That did not seem to be too likely an occurrence as of this moment seeing as the aforestated gym leader was a bit annoyed that he had been asked to watch a pick of fight Flint's Infernape. Sure Faulkner loved Electric-type Pokémon with all his heart but the man was still skeptical about a Piku lasting more than two minutes against Flint's Infernape. Scratch that, the Piku would be lucky to even hold on for a minute. Faulkner had no idea how wrong he was. By Faulkner's side, the proprietor was beseeching the deities above to aid him and Flint, hoping beyond hope that this battle did the trick. Only the proprietor knew how much trouble he went through to get Faulkner go along with the idea of watching this telecasted battle. It involved a rubber chicken and a ton of ham sandwiches. Don't ask, you really, really don't want to know. Back with Flint and Naruto. Are you serious? Bellowed Flint. Was this guy trying to make fun of him? This was an insult to Flint's pride. Which person in their right mind would think of doing something so preposterous? Not at all. I am completely serious about fighting your Infernape with my Piku. This Piku has a disease which prevents it from evolving, but that said it is on par with all of my other Pokemon. In fact. Replied Naruto who now had a teasing smile on his face. I want to make a bet with you. The loser of this battle will have to attend the opening ceremony of this year's Wallace Cup in a bright pink ballerina tutu. Some of the people gathered, mainly the gorgeous Cynthia, looked at the Namikaze as if he had just grown a second in the last few seconds. I didn't take you to be a masochist. If you want to do it then sure, why not? I will go along with it. Agreed Flint in a nonchalant tone of voice with a shrug of the shoulders. If Naruto wanted to dig his own grave then Flint was absolutely fine with that. If both of you are ready, then you may begin the battle. Announced Brock, kicking off the anticipated matchup. Flint, go ahead and start the ball rolling. You may have the first move. Offered Naruto, allowing the fire type specialist to strike before him. Flint was used to matches starting the other way around but called an attack nonetheless. Infernape, use fire punch. One of Infernape's fists became surrounded in red-orange fire and it tried to punch Piku with it. Piku, counter with iron tail. P 
Piku, making full use of its small body size, jumped onto Infernape's arm before running along the flame Pokémon's limb. Piku's entire tail glowed white and it hit Flint's Infernape in the face with it several times, making it look like Piku was slapping Infernape due to how tiny Piku was. Some of the spectators found this to quite cute as they, odd, to Piku's attack. Infernape brought its other hand to its face to swat away the pesky nuisance that was assaulting it. Piku saw it coming and jumped away before it could be hit. Piku, use the substitute style shadow clones. Let's go. There was a bright flash of light, which upon dying down revealed a group of 50 Pikus standing side by side, 49 substitute clones and one original. One thing Naruto loved about his Piku was its determination. That little critter had managed to master his substitute shadow clone technique better than most of his Pokemon except maybe his Darkrai. Yes. Piku was even better at using this than Naruto's Latios. Still, despite being ranked in second place to Darkrai, the ability to replicate nearly half a hundred substitute shadow clones was nothing to be shy about, more so if you were classified as a baby Pokemon in Piku's case. Use the Akimichi style, Pokemon Bullet Tank. Flint knew what Naruto meant when he saw the mini Piku army appear, due to the fact that he had seen the move in action in against Cynthia a while ago, but for the life of him he had no clue what this Akimichi style Pokemon bullet tank was. Flint watched as the Pikus ran at his Infernape, their bodies surrounded by golden electricity. While covered in electricity, each of the Pikus' bodies looked black and white. Flint concluded that Naruto was aiming to use a rapid succession of volt tackles. Flint was about to instruct his Infernape on what to do, seeing as defense was Infernape's specialty after all, when all the Pikus, who were now in the air as they headed for Infernape, curled each of their bodies into a ball and started moving at an incredibly heightened speed reminiscent to, as the name stated, a bullet speed. Realizing that this was a combination of volt tackle and rollout, Flint, knowing that his Infernape could not come out of this unscathed, told his Pokemon to do its best and dodge as many of the Pikus as possible. When the flame Pokemon managed to do as such while only sustaining two or three hits, Flint and his loyal Pokemon felt like breathing a sigh of relief. Infernape would not have that leisure as it felt something smash into its cranium. This was followed by a blow to the back of its left leg and something else scarping its back. The knocks and swipes kept increasing in quantity a couple of seconds later. Making a closer observation, Flint saw that all the Pikus were using the tree as springboards to propel themselves back and forth at his Infernape, striking it again and again. It was like a bunch of closely arranged molecules bouncing off the walls of a solid object that was undergoing a heating process with the only noticeable difference being that the molecules, Pikus, were colliding into his Infernape as opposed to each other. Flint felt like saluting Naruto, this combo was even better than most of the contest appeals that he had seen on TV from time to time. In Flint's eyes Naruto deserved a standing ovation. The blonde had succeeded in training his Piku to the extent that it was able to use Volt Tackle without enduring any recoil damage. Flint knew that this was very much possible seeing as his own partner, Infernape, had learned how to use Flare Blitz without suffering the drawbacks of recoil damage as well. However, for a Piku, a Pokémon that was reputed to shock itself by accident, this kind of feat was, it was. Flint did not even have the right word to say right now. Flint knew one thing, Naruto and his Piku had definitely come far. Most would already consider the fact that said Piku had overcome the shocking of itself to be a praiseworthy achievement, this just went levels above and beyond that. Yes, Naruto's Piku would prove to be a worthy opponent for his Infernape. It was time to get serious. With the spectators. Sugoi. Whispered a completely astounded Roland. He is actually doing it, Naruto's Piku is actually fighting Flint's Infernape as an equal. Croaked out a stunned Cynthia, her eyes as wide as dinner plates. She was horror-struck that a Piku of all things was capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Flint's Infernape. This was mind-boggling. Cynthia knew that Flint's Infernape was no walk in the park to go up against. It was stronger than some her Pokémon for crying out loud. Cynthia could not begin to imagine how much power and skill Naruto was keeping under wraps. On second thought, she did not want to know. She was not completely sure if she would be able to take that piece of information in and come out intact in one piece. Her mental health was more vital than the nagging curiosity in the back of her noggin. Back on the battlefield. Infernape, use swords dance then flamethrower. 
Infernape crossed its hands across its chest and spun rapidly while releasing a red-orange stream of fire from its mouth. This made it look like a fountain of fire that achieved its desired aim of getting rid of all the Piku clones. Now there was another problem, there was no sign of the real Piku. Flint scanned the battlefield in search of the tiny mouse Pokemon but there were no traces left behind by the electric-type Pokemon. Naruto's Piku is not anywhere around, it is not in the sky, as stupid as that sounded, then that only leaves. Thought a slightly panicked Flint as a sense of cognizance hit him. Infernape, look out below you. Flint's warning came a moment too late as Piku, now covered in yellow electricity, showing that it was using Volt Tackle, shot out of the ground like a F1 circuit race car, straight into Infernape. Normally Infernape would have been able to take a Volt Tackle by a Piku, no matter how powerful it was, in stride. Unfortunately, the location where this Volt Tackle hit was, less than ideal. You see, the Volt Tackle delivered a whammy to the region to between Infernape's legs, right in the sweet spot. This introduced the fire and fighting type Pokemon to a world of unimaginable pain. It never knew that it was possible for any part of its body to hurt this badly. Flint's Infernape, which was now jumping on one foot as its eyes bulged out of its sockets, really wished that it could have taken a normal hit instead this. Infernape wouldn't mind taking a Hydro Pump from a Kyogre or Suakun as opposed to what it now had to endure. That scenario involving the Hydro Pump currently seemed to be a whole lot more appealing to Infernape. So Naruto's Piku can use Naruto's bastardized version of Dig. Man, this technique is a real pain in the ass. Thought Flint as he watched his Infernape roll around on the floor as it clutched its nether region protectively. Piku, let the power of youth explode. Flint was dreading what was to come next. He knew that his Infernape, as it was, stood no chance of evading the next advance of Naruto's Piku. Flint looked on as Piku's body was engulfed in a white glow and another 44 Pikus appearing out of thin air. The bodies of all the Pikus were surrounded by electricity as they took off in Infernape's direction. The way all the Pikus were huddled together made the attack take on the outlook of an electric tiger. Feel the glory! Daytime Tiger! A very watered-down version of one of the signature techniques of Mado Guy collided with Infernape and an explosion could be felt around anything that was within an 800-meter radius of the battleground. With the spectators, it shouldn't be possible for any Piku to fight at this high a level. None of my calculations show that an end result like this is obtainable. Spoken awestruck Conway, his mouth agape, as he continued to try and analyze the face-off, which he thought would have been a landslide victory for Infernape, between Naruto and Flint. The blonde and redhead's battle was not going as Conway had scripted it at all. It was quite the opposite really. Conway was starting to think that normal logic would not be applicable in Naruto's case. This is insane beyond definition. Thought Ash, who had been struck dumb after he saw a Piku using weaker variation of a move that was usually done when a shinobi opened seven of the eight inner gates, not that Ash knew about the gates. Ash did not trust his voice at the present. He was certain he would sound like a spluttering mess. No need to unnecessarily embarrass himself. That was Flint's job seeing as how the member of Sinoa's Elite Four was having his Infernape get kicked around by a Piku, something which should not have even posed any threat at all to Infernape. Ash pinched his right cheek to make sure that he wasn't dreaming, which he indeed wasn't. Ash's Pikachu, which was perched on his left shoulder was looking at Naruto's Piku with stars in its eyes, Pikachu could not see Piku at the moment because of all the smoke kicked up by the last attack. Pikachu had an immeasurable amount of admiration for Naruto's Piku. Pikachu's pre-evolved form was showing it the true heights that it could achieve if it put its mind to it. This made Pikachu feel a whole lot better of its decision to not evolve into a Raichu. Pikachu now had the utmost confidence, even more than it had before, that it could gain strength to help its trainer, Ash, without needing to rely on any fancy SC Mancy Thunderstone. With Faulkner. I have never seen a Piku with so much determination before in my whole life. Stated Faulkner with a smile, an expression that was thought to be long lost to his face. It has been a while since you have enjoyed watching a battle, hasn't it Faulkner? Questioned the proprietor, who was also smiling himself. Faulkner would act like he was lazy and uncaring most of the time. This happy side of Faulkner was truly a nice change of pace. It kind of reminds me of the battle that Flint and I had with you when we were just kids. Said Faulkner, as he began to feel a sense of nostalgia enter his system. It sure does. Replied the proprietor, 
who had stopped his previous task of cleaning a plate, in a quiet tone as he took a short trip down memory lane along with Faulkner. With Jesse, James, and Meowth. The boss Piku is out of this world. Remarked a stupefied Jesse. She, James and Meowth were all watching their boss battle from afar using a pair of binoculars each, from their Meowth-shaped hot air balloon. They were incapable of watching the match up close for obvious reasons such as putting Naruto in a tight fix. However, that did not deter the trio of former Team Rocket grunts as they found an alternative method to get around this. It makes the twerp's Pikachu seem like a toddler. Said James, who was chewing on a biscuit. Another couple of biscuits were in his left hand while his binoculars were being held by the other. James and Jesse had long since discarded their Team Rocket uniforms and they were both now wearing identical attires. These attires consisted of a white fitting shirt with the Kanoha symbol on it, as insisted by Naruto, and a pair of black jeans. Jesse was wearing carpy jeans while James was wearing a pair regular ones. That doesn't matter. We got a cheer on the boss. That is most important. Commented Meowth, reminding Jesse and James of their main priority. The three of them all promptly put on a cap with Naruto's picture on it, creepy, and starting yelling, Go boss. You can do it. Go boss. You can do it. Go boss. You can do it. In the afterlife. Mado Dai was father of Mado Guy and a man who died when he used the eight inner gates to fend off the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist to protect his son and his son's teammates. It was a regular day in the afterlife for Dai. Ever since Sakumo Hatake had found peace and his soul had passed through limbo and entered the great beyond, the duo had spent a good majority of their time, they had nothing better to do anyway, chit-chatting with one another. Today they were both sitting in a cross-legged position and talking about their sons. Woasich. My youth meter reading is off the chart. I sense that there is great growth of youth somewhere. Whoever you are let your flames of youth burn brightly and may they never diminish till your last breath. Exclaimed Dai, who was now standing, at the top of his voice, throwing in a nice guy pose along the way. This earned him a sweat drop from Sukumo. The other people in the afterlife just backed away slowly from Dai, not wanting to be near him. Back on the battlefield. As the visible suspension of carbon that had been surrounding the battlefield cleared, Flint saw Piku standing in front of Naruto, completely unharmed. Infernape was a different story altogether. It was covered in countless bruises and scratches. It also looked like Infernape had something akin to a bloody lip, I am not sure if that is the best way to describe it for Infernape's case. This confirmed Flint's suspicions when he wondered why one of the Pikus stayed behind. There was also excess static coming off of Infernape's body, indicating that it was now paralyzed. What had happened was that all of the Piku clones, which had now disappeared, had charged forth using Volt Tackle. These clones had purposely upped the power of the Volt Tackles way past their normal limits, meaning that they all suffered tons of recoil damage as opposed to when they used a regular Volt Tackle. Then again, substitute clones were meant to disappear after taking a hit or a certain amount of damage, so Naruto simply exploited this little loophole, if one could call it that, to its fullest potential. In other words, the usage of overcharged Volt Tackles was a suicidal tactic that could only be utilized by Pokemon, safely at least, belonging to one man, Naruto Namikaze. A regular Piku, Pikachu or Raichu that attempted the stunt would earn itself a one-way trip straight to the nearest Pokemon Center's emergency ward. Sure it was nothing compared the true daytime tiger but Mado Guy's actual version of that could probably and most likely punch a hole straight through a Zapdos and still have some juice left in the tank. Clutching one of its sides, Infernape slowly got back up, albeit with a certain degree of difficulty. Keep going Infernape. We can't afford to throw in the towel. Spoke up Flint, encouraging his mightiest ally. Though Flint was probably doing it to save his own skin as well. Use Flare Blitz. Infernape's body became surrounded by red-orange fire and it shot at Naruto's Pika like a missile, preparing to slam into it with great force. When Infernape was charging at Piku, the fire around it turned light blue. Only at the very last second possible did Naruto issue his command. Piku, use counter. Almost instantly Piku's whole body was ringed in a dark orange color. Oh that sly motherfucker. Cursed Flint in his mind, gritting his teeth in frustration while he was at it. 
Flint's hands were tied as he powerlessly watched Infernape's flare blitz get bounced off Naruto's Piku as the fully evolved form of fire type starter of Sinnoh was then sent flying backwards and slammed into a tree, delivering double the amount of damage to itself. Who knew fighting a Piku could be so troublesome? Shikamaru would probably feel delighted that there were some people out there who understood him if he was here now. Without delay, Naruto put another one of his plans in motion. Piku, use flash. Piku's body began to glow brightly. In fact it glowed so bright that the light temporarily blinded everyone in the nearby vicinity. A couple minutes later, the after effects of flash died down, restoring everyone's vision back to them. The first thing that Flint's eyes discerned visually was that there were now 20 Pikus standing in Infernape's blind spot. All of them had matching devilish smirks on their faces and all of their paws were covered in yellow sparks like when they were about to use a thunder punch. It couldn't be, Naruto would really think of using. Leaf Village Secret Finger Jutsu, 1000 Years of Death. That foul and disgusting technique at a time like this. Infernape felt a sharp and excruciating pain in its behind as all the Pikus shoved their thunder punch enhanced paws up its rear in perfect sync, like it was an act that had been rehearsed many times over. Infernape was unceremoniously launched into the air and sent crashing into the ground 30 or so feet away, scooping up a mouthful of dirt along the way. Yuck! Everyone witnessing this face planted into the ground. They all had disbelieving looks on their faces. Which nut job would waste a perfectly good opening just to use a stupid trick like that? Apparently Naruto was that kind of person. Alas those people were blissfully unaware that Naruto was notoriously known as the number one hyperactive, knucklehead ninja back home for his antics. Speaking of being blissfully unaware, the Piku gang was ignorant of the threat that was still looming above their heads. They were made conscious of this danger when they heard a bolstering roar following by an enraged Infernape appearing on the battlefield looking like it was ready to murder something or rather someone, namely the Pikus in front of it. The R emerged Infernape did not look like its regular self. Its eyes were glowing red. Its head was glowing bright orange and the flame on said skull had grown to a massive size. To top things off, Infernape's body was surrounded by a fiery aura. Just my luck, why did the lousy blaze have to get activated now? Groaned Naruto internally. He knew exactly how powerful blaze was, due to the fact that he owned a blaziken himself. In a way, a powerful blaze kind of reminded Naruto of the times when he entered the Nine Tails chakra mode. Not something he wanted to go up against. Though blaze, if a shinobi were to look at it reasonably, had less than a hundredth of the power presented by the Nine Tails chakra mode. That still did not change Naruto's opinion on it. The look that Infernape was giving Piku screamed I am going to make you pay you little sneaky bastard. Infernape's pupils glowed orange and the fiery aura around its body intensified even further. It then fired five blasts of fire from its body, all of which were shaped like a. The blast obliterated all the Piku's clones. Fortunately, the actual Piku used Naruto's bastardized version of Dig to escape underground. Piku then resurfaced next to Naruto. Wowie! That is some power! Thought Naruto, unconsciously letting out a whistle of appreciation, as he admired Infernape's little handiwork. Five fire blasts back to back was quite the accompaniment. Flint was grinning like a Cheshire cat at this new development. Finally, something went in his favor, for once. With Jesse, James, and Meowth. Come on boss you can win this. That red-haired wannabe hunks Infernape has got nothing on you. Spoke a hopeful Jesse, James and Meowth, all three of whom were on the edge of their seats, anticipating how things would play out. Back on the battlefield. Infernape, let's turn the heat up. Use blast burn. Commanded Flint, a new load of pent-up energy spurting forth into his eyes. Flint was delighted further by the fact that counter did not work on moves like blast burn. He was also 150% positive that Pikus could not learn Mirror Coat, so practically he was in the clear here. Infernape's body became engulfed in light blue flames. It then punched the ground, sending a wave of energy into the earth which then moved underneath Piku. Shit! Piku has to dodge that or it is done for. Thought a frantic Naruto a few beads of sweat trailing down his forehead. Naruto knew that his Piku's endurance was not the best and that a blast burn of that magnitude would surely knock it out. That was why he had his Piku send clones in its place for dangerous attack moves, using them as cannon fodder. 
It looked like Piku was sharing its trainer's thoughts. Without needing to be told, it created a group of substitute shadow clones, all of which formed a ladder and quickly threw the genuine Piku into the sky, securely out of harm's reach. They managed to do so just in the nick of time because a split second later the energy from Infernape's blaze enhanced blast burn burst upwards in a giant explosion of red-orange flames, which looked like a mini-volcano eruption, annihilating all of them, the Pika clones. Oh dear Kami, please no. Not like this. Prayed a really desperate Flint, who was biting his fingernails as he stared at the airborne Piku that had landed and was now clinging on to his Infernape's back like a lifeline. The trepidations that Flint was experiencing doubled as he stared at the sight of Naruto's Piku making more substitute shadow clones, which were now holding on to various parts of his Infernape's body. Perhaps Lady Luck decided to smile on Flint. This was plausible because it was at the moment when all the Pika clones were tightly grabbing Infernape that said Pokemon recharged from using Blast Burn and regained its ability to move again. Infernape, shake them off quickly. Pleaded Flint in a tone that could be interpreted as begging. Piku, you can't let Infernape win. You have battled far too hard to lose here. Thunder maximum power. Ordered Naruto calling out what he hoped would be the finishing blow. Pichu. There was a bright column of yellow electricity that extended all the way to the skies above before a ground began shaking violently and a few small tremors could be felt by the people nearby. You know how a ripple is formed on the water's surface when an item is thrown into a lake. There was a matching ripple here too, only it was a ripple of the ground that was equal if not stronger than when a powerful ground-type Pokemon like a Swampert, or any Pokemon for that matter, used to move like magnitude or earthquake. For those of you that have watched Fairy Tail, think of Jura Niki's rumbling and Fuji. That will give you a better idea of what I am trying to portray here. With the spectators. Holy Reiku. What the fudge just happened? There should be a barrier set up for battles like this. I could have gotten seriously injured. Where is the hazard, danger zone ahead, and the observe at your own risk warning sign when you need it? All of the onlookers plus Flint had ungracefully lost their balance and fallen down after that last display, which produced a shockwave superior to that when Piku used its very own version of the daytime tiger. Roland had landed in the middle of Cynthia's breasts, something that many males nearby nearly exploded with jealousy about. Cynthia did let it go considering that she did not want to slap her surrogate little brother nor did she find him at fault. If only the little tyke knew how big a jackpot he had struck. Naruto was the only one whose feet had stayed planted on the ground, by channeling a little chakra into the soles of his feet, though no one noticed due to being distracted by other things. Chakra was wonderful to have around to help a person keep his slasher balance in a situation like this. Back on the battlefield. When the aftermath of the fissure was made visible, everyone could see Piku sitting on a knocked-out infernape in a crater that was at least 5 meters deep and 4 meters wide. The latter of the two Pokemon had swirls in its eyes. Infernape is unable to continue battling, the winner is Piku. Declared Brock, who had just gotten back on his toes, passing the verdict of the match. Although he had never imagined himself saying this at the beginning of the aforesaid match. When its hearing picked up what Brock had just said, Piku, now nearly completely exhausted, all of its clones had already dispersed, rushed over to Naruto, who got down on one knee and picked up the tiny mouse Pokemon before twirling it around in the air merrily in celebration. With Jesse, James, and Meowth. The boss won. We knew he could do it. Spoke the emotional trio as they hugged each other tightly. They had tears of joy streaming down their eyes. With Faulkner. As the match was concluded, Faulkner wordlessly got up from his left some change on the table to cover the expenses of the food and beverages that he had ordered, thanked the proprietor and started making his way for the exit. Where are you going Faulkner? Asked the proprietor. I have training to do. Answered Faulkner, his lips quirked upwards. Looks like I still have some unfinished business after all. A gym leader's job is to make sure that every bit of his battling spark is passed on to all challengers. Thanks to Naruto Namikaze, I finally understand that. All of his spark and that spark of his Pokemon too, watching Naruto battle has inspired me more than words can say. One thing is clear to me, I have to brush up skills. If I ever meet this Naruto Namikaze then I will give him the most electrifying battle of his life. Faulkner was back in business. All Sunnyshore City Gym Challengers had better watch out.
with Naruto. He did it. He beat both Cynthia and Flint in the same day. Clamored a random spectator as he rushed over to Naruto. Many others followed his example and not long afterwards, Naruto and his Piku found themselves hoisted into the air and put into a mosh pit before being hauled into the air, the eyewitnesses of the breathtaking battle cheering for them. Maybe this isn't such a bad day. Thought Naruto to himself. His schedule had been set back a tiny bit but this treatment he was getting more than made up for it. Naruto did not even know what brought this reaction on by the onlookers. And you what, frankly he didn't give a damn. He was loving all the affection he was getting from all the townsfolk of Heart Home City. Flint, who was moping in his corner of insta-depression, was ignored. Flint wished that the ground would just swallow him whole. Flint did not know how he was going to face his fellow elites after this. He had been virtually stripped of 99.53% of his dignity in under an hour. The ballerina Tutu promised that he had made to wear at the Wallace Cup was just the icing on the cake. Furthermore, Flint could not talk his way out of it because it was said on live television, meaning there were many people who had most certainly seen it. It was official, this was by far the worst day of Flint's life. There was one valuable lesson to be learned here, your value does not decrease based on someone's inability to see your worth. Most people wouldn't have spared a Piku that could evolve a second glance, but Naruto had taken that Piku in and transformed it into a total powerhouse, using his ninja skills to train Piku to cover all of its weaknesses. Their secret ingredient in their recipe for success was nothing more than a little extra elbow grease. The Pokemon world had a lot to learn from this man. Minus three days after Naruto's battle with Flint. It had been three days since Naruto defeated both Flint and Cynthia before departing Heart Home City. Naruto's day had begun like any other. Well if you asked him then he would tell you that it was one of the better days of his life after he evaluated the good and bad ratio of things that took place. Naruto had arrived in Emeragrove Town while on his way to Solation Town so that he could check out the Solation Ruins. Naruto had found out from Mutuo yesterday that Team Galactic had managed to finally acquire the Draco Plate and were about to make their move on the Spear Key in exactly 10 days time, meaning that Naruto had to arrive at the Solation Ruins in 9 days or less from now seeing as one day had already passed since he spoke with Mutuo. Naruto did not plan on staying in Emeragrove Town for very long. However, fate had other plans, extremely wonderful plans. Minus one hour after Naruto arrived in Emeragrove town. Naani. I can't believe this. I must be dreaming. Exclaimed Naruto, who was using the transformation technique to disguise himself, so loud that people thought that he was crazy. The minor alterations to the Namikaze's current look was that he now had red hair and green eyes as opposed to his regular blonde and blue ones respectively. Why was Naruto in disguise? That was because a certain woman, who had a crush on him, had managed to track him down and hound him non-stop for the past couple of hours. What was wrong with her? She lived in the Jato region for crying out loud. She wouldn't come all the way over to Sinno just to go after him, would she? Naruto really hoped not or he could possibly be having some creepy nightmares for some time to come. Stalkers like Hinata, not that Naruto knew she was one because he was quite dense in the past, aside, Naruto's good mood was still soaring on cloud 9. If you were to take a closer look at the piece of paper in his hands then you would understand exactly why. Attention to all those reading this. On this beautiful day the Emeragrove City Ramen Shop will be hosting its annual ramen eating challenge. The price of a bowl of ramen will be doubled today. However, if you can eat 10 or more bowls of ramen, then all the ramen you eat is free. Do you think you have what it takes? Come to the address of our shop, the ramen escape, as stated below, and try your luck. You may just end up getting yourself a tasty, free meal. Naruto's hands were now shaking in an unbalanced mixture of anticipation and shock. He was snapped out of his thoughts, when he heard the gentle, soothing voice of his deceased mother, somehow, saying, go Naruto, you can do it. Go eat all the ramen that shop has to offer. My ramen eating genes live on in you. Prove that you are my son. Naruto shook his head and took a few seconds to recompose himself. Not wanting to disobey a direct order from his dear mother, insert snort here, Naruto let his ramen senses guide him, like an airplane that was put on autopilot, to his next destination, the ramen escape. At the ramen escape. I want an extra, 
extra large serving of everything you have on this menu. Said Naruto flatly, placing the menu down on the wooden table he was sitting at. On second thought, just give me all of my order, ramen order, in the biggest size available at this joint. One of everything. The chef, who was also the owner of the modest establishment, had to clean his ears a few times just to make sure that he had heard that right. Coming right up kid, just make sure to stay in your seat until I get back with your order. Replied the now enthusiastic chef, who went by the name of Justin, heading into the kitchen to prepare the order that had just been placed by Naruto. Justin had large dollar signs in both of his eyes, which turned into golden bars when Naruto asked for the size of his order to be increased even further. Justin could already imagine all sweet cash he was going to make off of that blonde sucker. It was such a pity that Justin was just about to have the tables turned on him. Oh well, some people just had to learn these types of lessons the hard way. No pain no gain. As soon as Naruto had set foot in the eatery, which was reasonably empty for some awkward reason, he immediately made his way to the table nearest to the counter where Justin was before selecting his meal, or rather feast, for the day. This place reminded Naruto somewhat of Ichiraka ramen back home. Justin even looked like a younger version of Tuchi with longer hair and a more athletic build. Slightly over one and a half hours, it took a long time to cook all that ramen, later, Justin returned with a large tray in hand, trying very hard to balance all the bowls of ramen in it and not lose all of the profit he was about to make. Unbeknownst to Justin, he would end up making no financial gains at all from Naruto on this fine day. Justin's ramen promotion was about to be smashed into the ground by the spawn of Kushina Uzumaki, a woman who could eat even more ramen than her son when she was still in the world of the living. Minus three hours later. Can I have another serving please? Asked Naruto to Justin in a polite tone. Are you out of your mind? There is nothing left. You have eaten all of my shop's ramen supply for the day. I just sent one of my assistants out to get some more. Yelled a bewildered Justin, looking at Naruto disbelievingly. Justin's jaw had dropped and he was almost about to punch the redhead, Naruto is still using his disguise here, square in the face. Luckily, for Justin, he didn't. Was the son of Minato Namikaze a bottomless pit when it came to devouring ramen? The answer to that was yes, yes he was. I can wait. Responded Naruto, looking between the seven stacks of ramen bowls to his left and the cook of said ramen in front of him. Naruto had already begun fantasizing about how tasty his 89th bowl of ramen, yes he had already eaten 88 of them, was going to be. If you looked inside Naruto's head, you could see a chibi Naruto swimming inside a massive bowl of ramen while sliding down a slide of noodles. Wacky. Minus five minutes later. Out. 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 Screamed Justin as he pushed Naruto past the exit of the ramen escape. And stay out, you ramen inhaling vacuum. Justin then drew a considerably good sketch of Naruto's current appearance, the one under a transformation, before putting the word BAND in black capital letters below it and slamming the doors shut in said person's face. Justin could already feel his wallet and cash register crying, pleading with him to fill them up with loads of money. Alas it was a plea that would be unfulfilled. This was the last time Justin would ever advertise the ramen escape in such an unsatisfactory, mostly for Justin, Naruto was one delighted camper, fashion ever again. Naruto earned a new nickname that fine day, he was now referred to by Justin as the ramen slayer. Never think that you are mightier than the Namikaze people. Seriously, it is not worth the agony, and the humiliation that comes along with it. Minus one hour later. Can this day get any better? Thought Naruto to himself, a gleeful look on his face as he began rubbing his hands together. Not only had he gotten free ramen but now he was being presented with the opportunity to blemish a Hokage monument in the Pokemon world. Oh today must have been his lucky day. This Hokage monument was in actuality a life-sized model of Eren of Sinoa's Elite Four, which looked like a giant plastic statue of the green-haired man. Apparently the bug-type specialist was supposed to visit Emergrove Town in a fortnight's time and promote Pokemon battling by having Pokemon battles all around the area for a day, just like Gardenia had done two days ago, something Naruto had just found out about. This was going to be good. Naruto, 
still under the effects of his transformation technique, knew there was a reason he always kept a small ceiling scroll full of paint tins of various colors with him wherever he went. Since all the natives of Emmergrove Town had gone through all the hassle of making this giant figurine for Eren, to make the man's brief stay in the town more welcoming, it was only fitting for Naruto to enhance it for them. Q Evil Prankster Laugh Unnamed Location Eren's Beautifly, currently not in Eren's possession technically, his very first Pokemon, which Eren had released, that had trained on its own ever since it was a Wurmple just to gain strength in the hopes that it could one day rejoin Eren, could not pinpoint the precise reason why, but it had the unexplainable urge to blast ninja-trained blondes with a very powerful silver wind. Back with Naruto. All done. Now this is a work of art if I do say so myself. Spoke Naruto, wiping a thin sheen of sweat away from his forehead as he admired his handiwork. Eren's face was now adorned with a giant mustache and several kinds of frog-like markings on both of his cheeks. Eren also had a severe nosebleed and was now wearing a pair of devil ears. Eren also had the words, I like men, on his shirts, indicating that he was a homosexual. Naruto felt a little bad in doing what he did, just a little. But heck, everything was fair in pranks and war, right? Right? Anyhow doing stuff like this made Naruto feel invigorated, it made him alive. So Naruto would continue to pull pranks on almost anyone regardless of the consequences. That was just the kind of person he was and he wasn't planning on changing anytime soon. Naruto kind of hoped that someone could have at least spotted him while he was destroying almost all the masculinity that Eren's face held, but the security in this place was nothing compared to that of the Hidden Leaf Village. Konoha was far superior in that department so Naruto kind of concluded that he was asking for the moon with that last request. If trained shinobi couldn't catch him while he vandalized the faces of the first, fourth Hokage's back when he was only 12 years old, then there was no chance of the people in Emmergrove town, who were all akin to normal civilians, pulling off a feat like that. Later that day, outskirts of Emmergrove town. Naruto Namikaze was simply putting his feet up and relaxing. He had found a nice secluded area on the outskirts of Emmergrove town and chose to simply kick back for a while. This area was covered with short grass and there was a considerably large lake there too. The lake was not as extravagant as some other places in Sinnoh such as Lake Acuity, Lake Verity or Lake Valor but it was still quite large in size compared to a normal lake nonetheless. There were also a good number of trees, meaning the location was quite shady. Naruto was lying down on the soft, comfy grass with his hands behind his head. His current activity involved staring at the clouds without a care in the world. In the afterlife, Shikaka Nara was forced to stop smoking a cigar which he had gotten from, somewhere that no one knew, when he felt a spike in the laziness of the inhabitants of the living world. Why do I get the strange feeling that my son Shikamaru's slacking attitude has rubbed off on one of his peers? Thought Shikaku to himself. It was a question that not even his genius mind could not answer. Back with Naruto. A total of another 50 minutes and 42 seconds had passed and Naruto had yet to move a muscle since, his eyes remaining perfectly fixated on the visible masses of condensed water vapor floating in the atmosphere, high above the ground. Once the hour mark was reached, Naruto, who had dropped the transformation technique before he begun partaking in his previous activity, could not stand it anymore. He threw a sideways glance to a nearby bush about 65 degrees to his west before calling out, Oi! Are you two really going to keep hiding there all day? Naruto was no brainless twit, maybe in the past but not now. After he had finished improving Eren's look, he had quickly made his way to a deserted alley in town and dropped his disguise, reverting to his original identity. Ever since then, Naruto had sensed a couple of airheads following him, and no neither of them was his stalker from earlier. Thank goodness. Naruto shuddered at the mere mention of her name. She was like a pesky cold that could not be shaken off. Anyway back to the topic of the couple of Naruto followers, not in a literal sense, there was a rustling in the bushes before the aforestated duo emerged from their hiding spot, a rather lame one if Naruto had to rate it. Though that was mostly because they had atrocious stealth skills, when measured against Naruto's of course. The pair of people then took up a strange pose, prepare for trouble, and make it double, to infect the world with devastation, to blight all people in every nation, to denounce the goodness of truth and love, to extend our wrath to the stars above, Cassidy. And Butch, of course, we're Team Rocket, circling Earth all day and night, 
Surrender to us now or you will surely lose the fight. Snore. Both Cassidy and Butch both face planted into the ground. Cassidy had purple eyes and orange hair worn in pigtails. She was wearing a pair of triangular pink earrings. Her Team Rocket uniform took the form of a black short-sleeved mini dress with the team's red R logo on the front, plus a pair of white gloves that reached the sleeves and had a red stripe near that area. She was also sporting white thigh-high boots with the same stripe near the tops. Butch had brown eyes and short green hair. One of his most defining traits was undoubtedly his raspy, rough, gravelly voice that he had shown when speaking a couple of moments ago. Butch's voice was reminiscent to that of a heavy smoker. He was donning an almost identical outfit to Cassidy with a few minor differences to make it more befitting of a human belonging to the male gender. Get up you blonde idiot! Screamed an irritated Cassidy. She could not believe that this guy had the audacity to take a nap while her and her partner were reciting their motto, which was like a sacred mantra to them. Ah! What's the big idea here? I was having a wonderful dream about being Hokage and having Sasuke team as my personal servant. Spoke Naruto in a groggy voice as he rubbed his eyes to get the sand out of them before wiping away the drool that had accumulated on the side of his mouth. Butch and Cassidy chose to ignore the gibberish about Hokages that Naruto was talking about, thinking the Namikaze had a few screws loose. Who are you two? Asked Naruto. Weren't you paying attention earlier? Shouted an equally irked Butch. He and Cassidy had put a lot of effort into their motto. They would not let someone trample over it like this. I was asleep because the two of you were so boring remember? Pointed out Naruto, who was looking at the couple of Team Rocket members, based on their uniforms, with a lifeless expression on his face, one that would make Itachi feel respected. Cassidy and Butch had to spend the next five minutes, begrudgingly, repeating their motto in slow motion so that they could keep an eye on Naruto and make sure that he did not dose off again. So your name is Cassidy? Said Naruto, who was now sitting up, pointing a finger at Cassidy. And your accomplice's name is Bitch. It's Butch not Bitch. Butch. 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 Retorted Butch, stomping his feet on the ground repeated in frustration. Why couldn't anyone ever get his name right? Perhaps he should consider changing his name. Okay, I got it. Your name is Butch the Bitch. Replied a cheery Naruto in a tone that Cynthia normally conversed in when she had decided on what ice cream she wanted to have. A rain cloud started to form above Butch's head, which started raining a short while later, effectively drenching Butch from head to toe. Cassidy actually snickered at the sight. Of all the people that had mispronounced Butch's name in the past, Naruto was by far the most entertaining. As much as I enjoy seeing Botch humiliated. Butch threw Cassidy a hard glare, both for getting his name wrong and for insulting him. We have work to do. Cassidy and Butch both turned completely serious at this. Naruto Namikaze, our boss Giovanni is extending an offer to you to become his second in command at Team Rocket. Informed Cassidy, putting Giovanni's offer on the table for the son of Minato Namikaze to decide. What happens if I decline? Questioned Naruto, testing the waters. He wanted to know more about Giovanni's intentions first. We have been given strict orders to bring you in by force if that happens. Our boss is determined to have you and your Pokemon working for him, no matter the cost. Giovanni assures you that you will be well paid and that it will be worth your time. So what do you say? Will you join us? Will you join Team Rocket? Asked Cassidy, though Naruto could tell by the way she was looking at him along with that cocky aura around her and her associate, that they had something up their sleeve. I see. Spoke Naruto, who was now standing up, softly as he closed his eyes and pretended to be in deep thought. If you can defeat me in a Pokemon battle then I will come along willingly. To sweeten the deal, I will only use one Pokemon. Naruto enlarged a Pokeball and let out his Latios, his second strongest Pokemon, for battle. Who did these two think he was? Naruto would never join hands with Team Rocket, unless he went there as a spy. Cassidy and Bitch, Q imaginary Butch whining in the background, both smirked inwardly. They had this in the bag. Once they completed this assignment they were sure to get a huge promotion. Or so they thought, having not the slightest clue of what Naruto had in store for them. Butch took out a pokeball, in a similar mean to Naruto, and let out a Pokemon of his own. 
It was an Arcanine. Arcanine was a quadruped, canine Pokemon with an orange pelt marked by jagged black stripes. It had diamond-shaped ears with beige insides, black eyes, a round, black nose, and two pointed teeth protruding from its upper jaw. Its head, muzzle and chest were covered in shaggy, beige fur, except for two oval sections around each eye and ear. Long tufts of fur were growing behind its knees and around its ankles. Its underside was black and it had a billowing, beige tail that was bent in the middle. Each of its paws had three toes and a round, pink pad. Upon closer inspection, Naruto was able to tell that this Arcanine was approximately 6 meters tall, making it slightly above three times the height of a regular Arcanine. You may have the first attack. Goaded Butch, a teasing edge in his voice, one that Naruto was effortlessly able to pick up on. Oh, getting too big for his shoes now is he? I will teach him a thing or two. Thought Naruto, understanding that Butch was looking down on him. Cassidy probably was as well but Butch was a whole lot more vocal about it. Please forgive me for what I am about to do first Hokage, second Hokage and most importantly fifth Hokage. The fact that Naruto was referring to the leaders of the Hidden Leaf Village respectfully meant that he was most likely about to do something really fucked up. Latios, perform transformation 89W. Latios' body was shrouded in a bright white light like the time Naruto was battling Ash and Paul in the final of the Heart Home City Tag Battle Tournament. When the light died down, Latios was now replaced with a completely naked Tsunade Senju, 106cm wide bust, according to what Jiraiya had told Naruto, and all. Look at the size of those things. They have got to be at least an E. Those breasts are as large as bowling balls, no weight cannonballs. Thank you being merciful on my soul Kamisama and letting me see this day. Exclaimed Butch, bowing to the heavens above. Butch had taken out a pair of binoculars that used extra low dispersion glass for the lens and then started admiring every single inch of the fifth Hokage's nude frame. Cassidy and Arcanine looked on incredulously, not knowing what to make of this. Though Cassidy did feel envious of the person that Naruto's Latios had just transformed into. Cassidy bet a good amount of money that there was no such woman in existence. It was probably for the best that Cassidy remained ignorant of that fact. Latios, used the leaf strong whirlwind, utilizing a combination of speed and power. Tsunade, delivered a spinning back kick to Butch's head so quickly that he could not hope to follow Tsunade's, movements. Within a short period of time, Butch was seeing stars and getting dizzier and dizzier with each passing second. That was so worth it. Stated Butch, a perverted look, one that would have made Jiraiya feel ecstatic if he could see it, gracing his facial features before passing out into the state of a temporary comatose. Cassidy shook her head disapprovingly at the green-haired male's antics. Serves him right. Thought Naruto with a huff, his arms crossed as he looked at the unconscious form of Butch. Latios, having already reverted back into its Pokemon look, was back by Naruto's side. Latios, along with its trainer, was waiting to see what the orange-haired woman would try next. Don't feel too smug Naruto. Biff is an idiot. I am nothing like him. Said Cassidy, not realizing she had gotten Butch's name wrong again. Am I being smug? I don't believe so. It could be that you are experiencing dehydration. I mean the weather today is above average. Cassidy grit her teeth at Naruto's laid-back attitude. She could easily see the mirth in his eyes as he was speaking those last few sentences. Just one bite, the moment Arcanine's teeth make contact with his Latios, I will win. Thought Cassidy, trying to keep calm while not giving anything away outwardly. Cassidy knew that this Arcanine had been experimented on with many kinds of poisons by several of Team Rocket's top scientists, leaving its hard, bony enamel-coated structures in its jaws more lethal than ever. Arcanine's body had become accustomed to the venom-like substances, making it immune to them but the same could not be said about humans or other Pokémon. The toxins surrounding Arcanine's teeth were capable of paralyzing and restricting the movements any Pokémon or human within mere seconds of contact. That was why the head of Team Rocket had given her and Butch said Arcanine specially for this mission. It showed just how serious Giovanni was about recruiting Naruto into the ranks of his organization. Something worth mentioning was that this Arcanine was larger than normal due to the side effects of being experimented with the poisons mentioned earlier. Go ahead Naruto. It is common courtesy that I let my opponent have the first move so you may do so again. 
spoke Cassidy, hoping that Naruto's Latios would move in close enough for Arcanine to sink its teeth in it just once at least. Common courtesy my ass. Snorted Naruto inwardly as he felt like spitting at how ridiculous that comment was. Naruto knew that people from Team Rocket gave little to no consideration to things like moral values. If anything, Cassidy's actions had just confirmed Naruto's suspicions that she had a few cards left to play and it was almost certainly connected with that Arcanine in front of him, Naruto. How should I do this now? Pondered Naruto, planning his strategy carefully. Suddenly a light bulb appeared on top of his head and Naruto was now grinning from ear to ear in a wicked manner that would make a certain snake Sanin brim with pride. Latios, let's go with Transformation 53 you. Latios' body was shrouded in a bright white light again and this time the Ian Pokemon came out looking like one of the greatest traders the Hidden Leaf Village had ever seen, Madara Uchiha. Madara was a fair-skinned man with spiky, black hair that had a slight blue tint to it. Madara had waist-length hair with shoulder-length bangs framing the sides of his face, covering most of his right eye. Prominent creases were visible under each of his eyes. He was wearing a crimson armor with numerous metal plates, forming protective guards along his chest, waist, shoulders, and thighs. Madara was carrying an orange-brown gun by which had a long black chain running up it. He was wearing a metal belt, as well as a brown leather sash to hold some of his other weapons and a pair of belt sashes to hold two of his swords. Madara also had an underwater breathing mask on his face. Cassidy raised an eyebrow in amusement, wondering Naruto was hoping to achieve by having his Latios take on the guise of an emo-looking man, who appeared to be in his 30s or 40s. Latios, the time has come to execute the perfect Susanoo. Cassidy observed as Naruto's Latios, looking like Madara, used Psychic to float over to where the lake near Naruto was. Once there, Madara's eyes began to glow blue and all the water in the lake was also outlined in a similar color. Cassidy watched with unimaginable amounts of horror as all the water in the lake began taking shape and a giant spectral figure, the Susanoo, with a Tengu-like armor and two sets of hands, started forming around Madara. The Susanoo was made up of two entirely different sides that were conjoined along their spine, both of which had a distinct face, the front face had elongated canine teeth in its lower jaw bracket and two tusks growing from said jaw, while the back face had similarly elongated canine teeth in its upper jaw bracket and a single horn protruding from its forehead. The Tengu-like armor that had just formed around the Susanoo then split from its forehead down, revealing the Susanoo's eyes while obscuring the rest of its face. Things did not stop there as the Susanoo's head gained a long Tengu nose and two lines running down from its mouth to its chin area as well as hair which was tied up at the sides. The Susanoo wielded a distinct, undulating blade that resembled a traditional katana, held in its secondary right hand, complete with sheaths strapped below the secondary set of arms. The primary set of arms then began to change into giant eagle-like wings. All in all, Naruto's Latios had used the most powerful surf that it could muster and combined it with all the water in the lake before proceeding to use Psychic to shape all the water into a near-exact replica of Madara Uchiha's perfect Susanoo, creating Naruto's own version of the Uchiha clan's ultimate defense that was so large it was easily towering over all the nearby trees, looking like an imposing majestic warrior. Naruto had his Latios add an underwater breathing mask to the Madara's appearance because Naruto was not sure if the Ian Pokemon would be able to breathe underwater for prolonged periods of time, something that was required seeing as Latios was suspended in a Susanoo made completely of water. Still Naruto did not want to take any chances. In the afterlife. Hey Itachi. Yes your sway. I feel like something or someone is ripping off one of our clan's most prized techniques. Back with Naruto. When the water Susanoo took its first step, Cassidy and Naruto could already feel some vibrations in the ground, something that the latter was smirking about. The Susanoo took another step and the same vibrations could be felt again. It was about to take a third step when, hold on Latios. Stop. 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 Voiced Naruto putting his hands up, halting Madara, who turned to look at Naruto, in his tracks. You can't just get straight into the action like that. First you gotta deliver a catchy line that will make you look a hundred times cooler. Stated Naruto, who cleared his throat in preparation for the demonstration he was to give Madara. You have to do it like this, I am Madara Uchiha, you third class wannabe evil villains are nothing compared to me. Said Naruto performing a flawless imitation of Madara Uchiha's voice. I am Madara Uchiha, 
you third-class wannabe evil villains are nothing compared to me. Boomed Latios, putting in a little extra effort so that the aforementioned sentence, or catchy line as Naruto had called it, could also be heard by Cassidy and Arcanine. That was fantastic. I give it a perfect 10-inch informed Naruto with a thumbs up. Okay, you can kick that Arcanine's high knee all the way to the Unova region now. Use Giga Impact. The Susanoo spread its wings and used them to fly high into the air while facing towards the sky. As it did so, its body became surrounded by an invisible energy. A bright flash of yellow light appeared in front of its face and it faced itself towards the Arcanine, which was too scared to move, below. It then shot itself at Arcanine and an orb of light purple energy with spiraling light yellow streaks around it appeared around the Susanoo's body and it slammed into the evolved form of Growlithe with great force. It was all over for Arcanine the moment the Giga Impact struck. The fire-type Pokémon, regardless of its additional size, was sent crashing through several trees at once, which all landed on the grassy terrain with resounding thuds. I am done for. I don't stand a chance against something like that. Thought a frantic Cassidy, her body trembling and her lips quivering. She felt like she was going to pass out any moment now. It was then that Naruto said three words, which summed up her predicament in a way that was second to none. Welcome to hell. Gone was the carefree Naruto, now replaced by a man with a look as cold as steel in his eyes. This was the look of the blonde that had witnessed the horrors of war. This was not Naruto Namikaze the Pokemon trainer, this was Naruto Namikaze the shinobi of Konoha. Minus two days later, with Giovanni. We join one of our favorite notorious crooks in an unspecified Team Rocket base in the Kanto region. It is also here that we are treated to the unusual or usual, whichever way one chose to look at it, sight of Giovanni, the leader of Team Rocket, yelling at one of his grunts. What is this ridiculous piece of trash? Inquired a very irritated Giovanni, who was sitting on a comfy leather chair behind a well-carved wooden desk in the main room of the Team Rocket base. The ridiculous piece of trash as Giovanni had referred to it, was a giant clown head that said man was currently holding in his hands. I don't know sir. The package that was supposed to be delivered to us from our men in the Sinnoh region must have somehow been intercepted and changed. Reasoned the same grunt as before, who was now on his knees in front of Giovanni. This grunt was really worried about his job security at the moment. Well that is if being a low-ranking member of an illegal group that stole Pokemon for a living could be considered as a job. I don't want to hear any excuses. Get out of my office this very instant. Ordered Giovanni, leaving no room for argument. Giovanni's henkman slowly got up before exiting the room with his head hung low in dejection. Once the aforementioned grunt had left, Giovanni threw the giant clown head with all his might in an attempt to release some of his pent-up rage and displeasure at the failure of his recent plan. All the stupid grunt had to do was collect a simple power generator to fuel one of Giovanni's latest machines that the man had several of his Team Rocket inventors working on. Upon making impact with the door at a high velocity, the clown head started to shake a little before a small chip that was placed on top of it glowed red. A hologram projection of a figure appeared in front of Giovanni. This person was wearing an orange spiral mask and a black cloak with red clouds on it. Another trait of his was that he had a lone crimson eye with three tomo in it, the other eye, if he had one, was hidden from view by his mask. Hello Giovanni. Do you like Toby's present? Spoke the person in a childlike tone of voice, which was normally heard from seven or eight year olds. You are responsible for this monstrosity? Asked a clearly pissed off Giovanni, whose right eyebrow was twitching. Toby is helping you. Toby saw what a dangerous power generator your men were carrying. So Toby replaced it with something safer and more fun. Why? Because Toby is a good boy. If you do not return to me what is rightfully mine then you will come to regret it. Said Giovanni in an ice-cold tone. Giovanni had gained a tick mark and if one were to look at his face a little more closely, they would be able to see a vein bulging from his forehead. There is no need to get angry at Toby, Giovanni. Toby destroyed that old stinky generator. Why? Because Toby is a good boy. Do you want me to kill you? Giovanni wasn't kidding around. He was really planning to murder the buffoon, who he presumed went by the name of Toby based on the way the person was talking. From what Giovanni could tell, he thought that this Toby was a mentally retarded child. 
Perhaps Toby's parents dropped Toby when he was a baby and the guy had ended up hitting his head and sustaining severe brain damage. There was a high likelihood of that judging by how Toby kept going on and on about why Toby was a good boy. You are such a mini Giovanni. Toby even placed a nice little bomb on the clown head for you. Why? Because Toby is a good boy. Informed Toby as he held out a remote control with a big red button on it. Don't you dare do it, you come sucking bastard. Snarled a now extremely raging Giovanni. What is that I hear? Said Toby as he placed a hand near his left ear. You want Toby to press the button to show you the big boom boom. Okay, Toby will do it. Why? Because Toby is a good boy. Toby stretched out his right index finger and reached for the button within slow motion, just to tease Giovanni a little more. Boom! The entire room Giovanni was in was now covered in whipped cream from top to bottom, proving that the bomb was intended to be used as a method to prank Giovanni rather than put an end to his life. See Giovanni, Toby helped you redecorate your whole room and saved you a lot of time. Why? Because Toby is a good boy. The projection of Toby then faded into nothingness. Toby. When I get my hands on you, you are dead you hear me. Bellowed Giovanni, whose body was now enveloped in whipped cream from head to toe. His voice was so loud that it caused a flock of Pidgey that were nearby the Team Rocket hideout to flee in fear. Every last member of Team Rocket, Rookie or Elite, spent the remainder of that day searching each and every source for any information they could obtain regarding the mysterious Toby. Unfortunately, they found Jack Squat and were forced to make their way back to the drawing board. In reality Toby was just one of Naruto's shadow clones under the transformation technique, which Naruto had deployed to foil some of Giovanni's other plans that Naruto had recently learned about while also getting some old-fashioned payback at Giovanni for sending out peasants such as Butch and Cassidy after him. And Naruto had done it in prankster style. Thanks for watching, I hope you guys enjoyed, if you did, comment down below and let me know. See you in the next video.